I feel so good after eating several high-protein meals. I feel like I could fight a tiger. How could that be bad? The chemical composition of uric acid, a byproduct of protein metabolism, is remarkably similar to that of caffeine. You're not getting any energy from the high-protein meals. You're receiving chemical stimulation. Hormones jump into the picture when you're talking about behavior change, right? Anytime someone says hormone, think of like a dictator, like a military general commanding the troops, barking instructions, and they have no choice but to follow the instructions. That's a hormone. This is all what is conventionally accepted. You can go down a rabbit hole of how exactly science claims to know these things. There's gonna be stuff that's like, ooh, it, it, it can be a bit sticky. It's, it's a strange hole that you can go down. All I'm saying is this is what is conventionally understood. I am so sorry about that, friends. Okay, so let me, yeah, let me, let me not uh, delay here. Let me just pick up where, where I left off. Hormones. You, you'll very often hear hormones jump into the picture when you're talking about behavior change, right? So what are, what are hormones? Hormones are chemical messengers, just like the neurotransmitters we talked about. Okay, so neurotransmitters are um, chemical messengers that are set, created by the nervous, nervous cells and sent throughout the body. Hormones are very similar. They're chemical messengers as well and they're released by mainly the glands from your endocrine system. And they travel through the body via the bloodstream to the target cells, okay? Uh, and then hormones tell those cells what to do. So think of, think of hormones, like anytime someone says hormone, think of like a dictator, like a military general commanding the troops, right? Just, just barking instructions and they have no choice but to follow the instructions. That's a hormone. Um, there are water soluble hormones and there are fat soluble hormones. The water soluble hormones bind to receptor sites on the cell surface. I'm going to stop myself there just for a second. This is all what is conventionally accepted. All right. You can go down a rabbit hole of how sci how exactly science claims to know these things. And there's going to be stuff that's like, ooh, it, it, it can be a bit sticky. It's, it's a strange hole that you can go down. Um, so all I'm saying is this is what is conventionally understood. Okay. However, there might be some things that are a bit uh, maybe hit or miss when it comes to how science actually comes to the determination of how these things are known. And, and but that's that's a subject for a different for a different day. OK, so water soluble hormones and fat soluble hormones. So the water soluble ones bind to the cell on the surface of the cell and then communicate their information through the membrane. And then the fat soluble hormones they enter the cells themselves. The whole hormone enters the cell itself. And that, no, no. Oh my goodness. My, my apologies, please. Anyway, so that's hormones, okay? And you have the two types, water-soluble, fat-soluble. Dopamine, you're going to hear that come up all the time. Dopamine is the main chemical signal messenger for pleasure. It, it's, um, it causes an excited type of euphoria. Basically, dopamine encourages an organism to pursue something and continue that pursuit. So remember when, remember when I said uh, we're talking about stuff that's advantageous. <laughs> Advent advantageous for survival. Remember that term. Oh yes, okay, good. We're, we're, I think we're done now. Okay, so uh, advantageous for survival. So dopamine is the main chemical messenger that gets released when you run into things in your environment that are good for survival. All right. And there's a different set of neurotransmitters that are responsible for stimuli that are offensive or repulsive in your nature that are not good for survival. All right. So, um, but those are, those are separate. And then serotonin, excuse me, you'll, you'll hear that come up a lot in these, in these types of, uh, in these types of instructionals or lessons on brain chemistry or, or behavior or how food affects behavior. Serotonin will come up. That is also a chemical messenger. These are all chemical messengers and found in the nervous system. And that communicates information through your brain and body. Okay. Uh, serotonin is... So if you're new here, I'm Professor Spear. I practice something called the mucusless diet healing system by Professor Arnold Arad. I've done so for over 22 years and I've helped thousands and thousands of other people ever had any questions that you wanted to ask me personally, then I want you to join the Mucus Free Life membership. When you do, you're going to get direct access to me. I do two coaching calls per month. You bring your questions in and we're going to go through everything. We have two accountability calls per month. We have our own social media platform called Mucus Free Social. You also get access to the menu and recipe library. We also have exclusive training sessions 
workshops with me, all kinds of fun stuff planned for the membership. My opinion is reading the book alone is not enough. So many people have read the book, but they didn't have the structure, support, and accountability to keep them on track, to decode certain things that were still confusing. That's what the membership is all about. You're going to have access to a community of people that actually care about your success. There's nothing else out there that's like this because there's nothing like the mucus's diet healing system. This is one of one. You want to get the benefits out of it, then you're going to want to join the mucus-free life membership. Click the link right now. See you in there. Okay. All right. So yeah, five, finishing up on serotonin. Um, it, uh, some of the things it does contracts intestinal muscles, helps food move through the system, acts on gut nerves, uh, low levels of serotonin linked to depression, anxiety, um, helps regulate your sleep cycle, mood, appetite. So this hormone is very, um, very relevant to those, to those topics. So if your food has anything to do with influencing your body and influencing the hormones that you, um, that you produce, then of course, these, of course, these things are going to be super, super, super influential on your, on your behavior, right? Um, you might, you might wonder what the difference between hormones and neurotransmitters are, and we already went over it, but just so you have this clear distinction in your mind, because it's, it's, people don't go over this stuff like very often. Sometimes presenters just like to breeze over these terms. It's yeah. so annoying. It's so annoying. I, you see it all the time. So I'm just making sure everyone's you know clear on this. So the different, what the difference between a neurotransmitter and a hormone is, is that neurotransmitters are created in only cells of the nervous system. So nerve cells, and they only travel a very short distance in what's called a synapse, right? The, the space between two nerve cells or a nerve and the target cell. Maybe it's a muscle cell, maybe it's something else. But neurotransmitters only jump a small distance between cells and they're initially created in the nervous system, okay? Neur neuro, right, is, is kind of the prefix for nerve, right? Hormones are also chemical messengers, but they're created in the endocrine glands. And they can also travel very long distances to all parts of the body. So you have a gland, it produces a hormone, and, and that is also an information packet, chemical information packet. That hormone dumps the chemical information packet into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream communicates it all throughout the body, okay? That's the difference between neurotransmitters and hormones. One starts in the gland, the hormones, and the other starts in the nerve cells, the neurotransmitters, okay? Uh, no, that's a repeat. Okay, so now um, I will not go into this quite yet and because this is some of the more esoteric, uh, esoterica. Um, what, I <laughs> what I will do is I will read this really quickly and then I'll, and then I'll shoot it back to you. Yeah, if you have, well, I mean, I know you were speaking for, for a while while I was gone. So well, yeah, you could probably do, yeah, if you want to yeah, do your the, go over the, the studies and then, and then you could go ahead and start the esoteric. And okay. Then, uh, yeah. And then, cause then my, my, what I have to share on that will be good after you do okay. yours. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Let me just cue something up here. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> um, talking about the effects of food on behavior, uh, I was, I was looking through a, uh, through a manual, through a book, uh, the life sciences health system uh, by TC Fry. It's basically an, an encyclopedia, a natural, um, you know, natural hygiene encyclopedia. And I, it was interesting. I found this, uh, I found this little, this little blurb here and it's a question that was uh, asked um, of TC of TC Fry and the question reads I feel so good after eating several high protein meals I feel like I could fight a tiger how could that be bad and the answer that he gives is well there's a good reason that you feel so energetic a quote unquote energetic or stimulated after a high protein meal the chemical composition of uric acid a, a byproduct of protein metabolism is remarkably similar to that of caffeine you're not getting any energy from the high protein meals. You're receiving chemical stimulation, chemical stimulation. Heavy protein eaters are always quote unquote high on drugs, either from the stimulating effects of the uric acid byproducts, or they may actually be intoxicated on the alcohol that forms in the body from the protein fermentation. So I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. And yeah, that's, that's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought that was pretty interesting. So I was curious about uric acid levels and if that affects the body and if, if it does act like caffeine, there was, there were, uh, there was one study that claimed that uric acid did not act by the same mechanism as caffeine, but, um, but that, you know, that also draws up a whole bunch of questions. I mean, it doesn't act by the same mechanism. Okay. So does it act right, by just right. some other mechanism that you're yeah. not measuring, you know, that, that has a very similar type of exciting property, right? You, you don't know, right? 
because again science is very very narrowed in its scope very narrow yeah yeah well because it seems like they've done those studies on you could watch a, a documentary i was always wanted to do the, take this uh where they would take the the th how different things go into the body if you you know the, those documentaries you smoke weed then they show the illustration of the lungs and then mm. how that smoke the the different properties and they'll break down the different chemicals that are being absorbed into the uh the 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 inside of the lungs and then how that goes to the brain and goes down to the heart and you know so they it's like they throw out the pattern all that but then when it comes well okay well how does if meat is a stimulant as if we can establish if we could establish that or if we could hypothesize that just to test it then what are the ways in which it is stimulating the body and stimulate from the brain or whatever you know but it's like where are those studies at right you know, they didn't add there's not a lot of people asking that question like you said right right, right exactly um now that isn't uh that wasn't the only study of course i did find studies that did kind of corroborate this so this one was interesting uh, so this is the impulsivity so impulsivity is associated with uric acid and this is evidence uh, taken from evidence of humans and mice so I can, I can just very quickly go over this. Um, the evidence from disparate lines of research suggests that uric acid is elevated in psychiatric disorders characterized by high impulsivity, such as attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder, bipolar. And the present research tests hypotheses that impulsivity is associated with high uric acid in humans and mice. So that's what they're, that's what they're investigating here. Mm. And um, in, the, in both human samples, these are the results, uh, the emotional aspects of trait impulsivity Speci um, spe specifically impulsivity, excuse, excuse me, impulsiveness and excitement seeking were associated with higher levels of uric acid uh, concurrently. And when uric acid was measured three to five years later, uh, three to five years later, period. Um, I'll skip, I'm going to skip down. Okay, so the study highlights. Uh, let's go to conclusions because uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, higher, so conclusions, higher uric acid was associated with impulsivity in both humans and mice. And the identification of biological markers of impulsivity may lead to a better understanding of the physiological mechanisms involved in impulsivity and may suggest potential targets for therapeutic in intervention. Um, so they're, they're, uric acid and caffeine are very similar in, in composition. Of course, that doesn't mean that they are the same, but uh, what they found in this and in some other studies as well is that there does seem to be this correlation between behavior modifications and elevated levels of uric acid um and i won't quick, I, i'll, I'll yeah, say yeah. just uh so for yeah uric acid they they say it's a nor normal body waste product right forms uh it gets a definition but what i thought was interesting here so when it says well what causes high uric acid so in any of this this is the the, the google <laughs> the google yeah. causes yeah. of high uric acid in the blood include uh, diuretics water retention and relievers drinking too much alcohol drinking right. too much soda or eating too much of foods that contain fructose, a type of sugar. So not one word of the acid forming properties of decaying flesh nope. <laughs> in the nope. body. We're nope. not going to mention that. That's all you get. That's all you get. You get all this, the peripheral in influences. You don't get yeah. the main one, right? Yeah. The, the main, one. the main one, like, Oh, oh sugar, yeah. sugar, you know, sugar and drink water retention. Okay. Well, well how did you can, how did the body get into a condition that it would begin to retain water? What, yes. What's that about? Like, yes. Well, we're not going to talk about that. We're just going <laughs> to exactly. blame everything else but meat. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. It's it's such a it's such a funny thing. It's frustrating as hell too. Um, there's so there's I will, I'm not going to read everything like I did before. I'm only going to read these last couple main points that I that I highlighted here. So this is another study: the influence of serum uric acid on the brain and cognitive dysfunction. And I'm again, I'm kind of looking at this because this whole meat eating thing is just it's just one of the the main issues that we're reeling from so i figured it was it was good to just stick on this but anyway so the influence of serum uric acid on brain and cognitive dysfunction i'll skip right to the end main points high levels of uric acid in the blood have been shown to impair cogn uh, cognition but they also found that no quote unquote normal levels may have some benefits as an antioxidant so they found that uric acid could you know they weren't poo-pooing uric acid completely it, it's it's a normal byproduct of protein breakdown and degradation and so they, they were saying that there's some yeah. normal levels of this seem to have a positive effect um whether it's that they have a positive effect or that's just a normal level of uric acid that's concomitant with eating food that 
you know you have to disregard you have to right. eliminate a portion of it I, I i don't know but anyway main conclusion was that yes there definitely are problems with elevated levels of uric acid and over time those can cause inflammation and problems and you're you're going when you have that happen you're going to be influencing your serotonin levels your your um, um, your dopamine levels you're going to be affecting your your neurochemistry and so your behavior will change um and um and if they're at normal levels then uh, you know everything is you know everything's everything's great i want you to look right here there's another great video specifically for you so click right here and i will see you over there peace love and breath